Um, thanks a lot indeed, Ma uh, um, uh, Mareke. Uh, it is a pleasure to have been your student as well. Um, I am uh, I'm particularly nervous, uh, which confuses me, but that is because I'm speaking to, uh, I think, my main community, and I'm super honored to be able to do that. So thanks a lot, Kai and Carlos, for this invitation, particularly that I can speak at a conference that talks about form and force. I hope to convince you that indeed it is important to look at form, where another way to say this is to uh, really get strength out out of or through geometry indeed. Uh, with the risk of repeating, I will um, start with some statements that have been addressed already by several others, uh, certainly in the other keynotes. Um, on the top here, looking at the construction of the dome of ETH Zurich, and on the bottom, you see the construction of the only high rise in Switzerland, the Prime Tower. I would argue that the fundamental difference between these two images is that on the bottom they're wearing helmets. <laughs> this is almost 100 years apart. The world around us is very quickly changing, so why are we still building like this? This is a big issue because, as we heard before, in the next 30 years we will be at least 2.1 billion more people on this planet. And I am very pleased that now very visible people uh, like Bill and Melinda Gates in their annual letter talked about their surprise how bad building materials and the building industry in general is. And to make sure that everyone understood how problematic or challenging this is, they calculated what we are faced as an industry. In order to provide an average um, housing infrastructure for these 2.1 billion more people that all need to be on the same planet, we need to build one New York City every month for the next 40 years. So try to imagine how much mass, how much construction is in Manhattan. So that needs to be built again every month for the next 40 years. So that is our responsibility. And the way we are constructing in our 100-year-old outdated ways we are polluting beyond control, more than transportation. We are being extremely irresponsible with respect to virgin natural resources. And to make this picture even more positive, we are responsible for a gigantic amount of waste. And this is even a very low estimation compared to numbers that you've seen in the other presentations. So without too much detail, I hope that with these, again, same message that you will all agree, I hope, that we need to do two things. We need to really design, think how we, and change how we design our structures, but also how we build our structures. We need many solutions, and I don't, I will not claim that I have the only solution, but uh, my lecture will show how you can combine strength through geometry and digital, or more specifically, computational fabrication to actually really provide game-changing opportunities. I'm both an architect and a structural engineer, so I call myself a structural designer or confused. And this is why I uh, care about this. This is a very typical image. Uh, Bill showed it because this is data from SOM, in fact. This is a very typical image when you go a little bit higher, which we will have to do to provide for all these people. This is 10 floors and up. This is a very typical image that three quarters of the way to be uh, this, um, considered in design is actually in the structure. So you have this absolutely weird chicken or the egg situation that the structure is there just to keep itself up. So that is the first thing what we can address. All right, there is also some opportunities. Like the first one is how can we reduce that pollution? Well, much of that pollution is really in the embodied energy, the embodied carbon in, in materials. And so by reducing the structural volume, by introducing structural geometry, which we are the experts, we can do better. But that is not enough. All predictions say that if we just do a little bit less bad, that is not enough. And that is where I will show you that in the realm of structural geometry, if you stick to funicular form, form, which means compression, like vaulted structures of the past, that you can not only reduce volume, but also do this with very low stresses. And last but not least, my entire argument is 100% academic. If I cannot demonstrate to you that we now have opportunities to realize these complex structural geometries, because we need to be economically viable, competitive, otherwise this will never come true. 
All right, let's go through all of them. Structural geometry. For those of you that know our work, you know that I then did my PhD at MIT with John Oxendorf on assessment of historic structures in unreinforced masonry. And working on these kind of be beautiful structures, like these fan vaults at King's College at University of Cambridge, I grew increasingly intrigued, but also increasingly frustrated, because these shells have been happily standing for more than 500 years, just with unreinforced stones, so big pieces of stone kept in equilibrium. They have a structural shell of 10 centimeters to 15 centimeters at the end for a span of 1-3 meters, 13 meters. So if you calculate and cut an eggshell in half, this is literally the same proportion. Can modern engineers, can modern designers discover these forms? Do we dare to sign off on a structure that is unreinforced and that will have to stand through all, all the different loading cases? They haven't changed, gravity hasn't changed, wind hasn't changed, so that is what got me hooked. Okay, I'll make a lot of shortcuts because I'm, yeah, it doesn't matter. Uh, but this is two extreme ways to look at structures and unfortunately in history around 1821, and I will leave you discover which one that is, engineering only s started to care of what happens on the left. So only stresses in materials. But actually, these historic structures are standing because they have a good shape. And their geometry, proportions, that is what's fundamentally driving them. I have a very cl clear proof of this, because all these Gothic masterpieces were built centuries before the only theory of structures we, 99% of the world, is being taught in schools. Luckily, not at ETH. Um, one way to discover these efficient forms is the inversion of the hanging chain. I don't have to talk about this here in, in uh, Barcelona, these hanging models of Gaudi, but it's very painful, tedious to make these hanging models, so people discover it, very powerful tools like graphic statics, to actually relate the geometry of a stru structure to its equilibrium. Um, I like this book, very important reference for anyone in graphic statics, Bo, Robert Bo, and you see that the title of the book doesn't even mention graphic statics. It's about economics of construction, and graphic statics was offered as a technique for designers to actually know what they're doing. So designers used to be able to know directly and actually included in their, into their designs the re relation between form and force. I had to include this even though it's a small digression, but I'm proud that I extended graphic statics to 2.5D for vaulted structures, like Bib Baker said. Indeed, if you have parallel loading, then these loads disappear in your projection and you can use very clean form and force diagrams to control the indeterminacy of this kind of problem. And so like in graphic statics, we have a very explicit way. Also relating to Bill, he said about Rhino, all the tools suggest sophistication nowadays, but do they give us insight? I think we need insight as designers to do better. And so this is a very wide box uh, tool, and I'm referring to uh, graphic statics. I forgot to say, also very proud, IASS alum, I got a Hangai Prize in 2007 for that research I did as a PhD student with John Oxendorf. But because you can really simulate anything, tweaking boundary conditions, benchmarking your material model, and so on and so on on the computer. We took the 2016 Venice Biennale to make a statement. So this was done by my group, the Block Research Group. The engineering was conveniently done by the office I have with John Oxendorf and Matthew de Jong. And then we have this long-term partner that kind of made this craziness happen. What I'm talking about is this monster. We called it the Ar Armadillo Vault, 16 meter spans with just five centimeter of unreinforced stone. So the, these are 399 cut stone pieces that are held together by geometry. No glue, no mortar, no reinforcement. This is geometry, the beauty of geometry at play. And maybe this image shows how thin this leaf in beautiful compression is. Of course, nothing of this is possible without computation. And as academics, this was actually the work of Matthias Rippmann. He developed the entire kind of digital change to include all of these hard constraints into the process. At this point, even though a big argument for me is that we need computation to realize this kind of sophisticated integration of structure, fabrication, construction in a design process, but I also strongly believe that if you 
put crap in a computer, that crap will come out. These are my initial sketches that were done. And then after this sketching, we did some digital explicit sketching using RhinoVault. I don't have too much time for this project, but we had about five months. Five months for design, engineering, convincing the Italian local engineers that we were not absolutely crazy, fabrication and construction. A typical process would be someone designs a nice form, the engineer tries not to kill anyone, and then we send it to a fabricator. So the fabricator did the test and calculated how much it would be to cut all these pieces in a more traditional way. It, took, it would have taken two and a half years. We had only one month, so what did we do? We used these more, more kind of efficient techniques, big blades, wire cutters, and so on. And we did some architectural geometry to, for example, constrain our solution that we never had to flip the piece, that is the first image, we cut the interfaces uh, with these big blades, we approximate the inside with just a few cuts, and then Hector hammers them away so that they look uh, roughly ev even. Because I didn't want to risk any colleague to say it's the mortar that it's holding up, even though that is absurdity, it's the glue, it's the whatever, so I wanted to have a full dry assembled structure. And in order to do that, we needed to be within 0.4 millimeters tolerance per stone. You can check this yourself, this 3D puzzle would never come together. That is what we did with these uh, custom profiling tool, but, tools. But why I say this in this audience is that we used this to add this. These are six millimeter little registration grooves. And why is this important? Well, first and foremost for logistics on site. You have only five centimeters and the masons need to align these stones to be exactly where they need to be. But as a structural engineer, dealing with unreinforced masonry, both in design and in engineering, 100, 200% certain you cannot say how this structure is standing because there will be tolerances, not everything will be perfectly aligned. And this little detail, pragmatic detail, allowed us to make certain assumptions in our, in our uh, analysis that we did with discrete element modeling that we would never have local sliding, so that we actually don't have an issue of friction. I also talked about computation, but if we would not have listened to these experienced master builders, then this would never have come together. And so that is also an important mes message that I really believe that computation can enhance what we can offer, but if we don't listen to people that actually know how things come together, we are lost as well. So this peculiar aesthetic is actually entirely driven by the fabrication. We didn't have two and a half years, but just one month, because we did a top-level computational strategy. All the cutting lines are also perfectly aligned to the, an, uh, an interpretation or an interpolation of the force flow. Of course, we don't go on site with these kind of things without doing a lot of research, without having a lot of, uh, a lot of failures as well. And I want to maybe, in between, quickly share a project that we didn't do at all. And why I share this project is because I think this is one of the most beautiful projects that has been built using, designed using a Rhino Vault. I show this because I want to do another message. Suddenly, this project was winning a lot of prizes, and we were explicitly mentioned as co-designer because Eight years before, we had developed and freely shared our core knowledge, which is Rhino Vault. And this, to me, is super exciting in the context of sharing open source and so on. I will come back to this, that actually this might really come back to be a big advantage. They are not only inviting us as experts. In this case, we didn't even have to do anything, and we got credit anyways. By the way, some insights how this was built. A nice anecdote here. This is the rebar of a traditional concrete structure next doors in the middle of nowhere in India. And Sami Padora asked, can I borrow your, 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 your reinforcement to make this surface? Because in India, they don't have Catalan tile falters. And so this was then done like this. This is before decentering. And just uh, beautiful work. Thanks a lot, Samit and team. Um, by the way, how cool is it to work in a context where you don't need railings? This is perfect. Uh, these, are the, these are the teachers um, walking over this library. OK, the next message is about uh, other materials, better materials. And there, again, we go to the past. So here, tile vaults inspired by my, my advisor, John Oxendorf, uh, Guastavino. Do you recognize this? This is in the basement of Grand Central Terminal. 
uh, the, train, the main train station at New York City, the Oyster Bar. What you're looking at is not decoration, but one of multiple layers, typically three, of unreinforced tile that is, on top of that, built in stable sections using lightweight tiles and a fast setting mortar. I expect being here in Catalonia, I don't have to give more detail on this technique. I was lucky to have been asked to make a small contribution to this absolutely sensational project. You might, you might, I hope you have seen it, designed by Peter Rich and John Oxendorf, and then worked out by Michael Ramage and also constructed. What I'm looking at, uh, uh, what I'm talking about are these beautiful tile vaults in a very remote location in South Africa. And everything was done with local resources. So this is traditional tile vaulting. So these people were farmers and carpenters uh, a week before they started doing this. So all the timber that you see is actually reusable guide work uh, to make sure that we hit exactly that, that right geometry. And so these are some of the results. But the message that I want to say is that rather than shipping our traditional materials to this remote site, this was also done with local soil and just a little bit of cement to stabilize these tiles. I like the contrast here. And this is why I showed this very old project, because it opened my eyes more than any other project I've been lucky to be part of. On the right, you see that the materials need to be brought on site in very small packages. And that is because they're designed to only take two megapascals in compression. So that is 10 times less than the most standard concrete. So basically peanuts in compression. But if you hold this tile on one end, it just breaks in bending. So you can just snap it in front of you. That is why they need to be brought on site so carefully. But if you place this weak material where the forces want to go, then it becomes a structural material, 100% safe, like the historic structures. But do notice, by the way, the tension tie. This is not a curved beam. You need to restrain the, uh, the, the, the supports. So this, to me, is an important message that our colleague material scientists are always pushing for more and more megapascal. But typically, this more and more megapascal goes together with more and more pollution, more toxicity, and so on. And this is an important message. Small learning opportunity, an arch is extremely good for a certain loading case, but if you don't have double curvature, positive double curvature, like in the armadillo vault, if you have non-uniform loading, then your truss lines exit the section, which, if you don't have bending capacity, shortly set means collapse. So, one other strategy than double curvature is to add local structural depth with stiffeners. And then if you add a tension tie, by the way, you understood this 10 seconds of little learning experience, right? In 10 seconds, what I actually did with you is we just together provided a 70% lighter equivalent than a floor plate to a floor plate. So just by reintroducing this simple scheme, and so that is an important thing that I, that I will come back to later, but of course we do this to provide, and Bill was talking about this, can we leapfrog this developing context, do they have to go through the same inefficiencies like we built? Sometimes we do some fun things, like this was a pavilion in New York City, 100% out of compressed Tetra Pak, so cartons of milk and so on. And this was a three by three, no, four by four by three and a half uh, bonding box uh, meter structure entirely out of mycelium, compressive strength 0 0.2 megapascals. So you can also, Strength through geometry doesn't just need to be an arch. It can also be a 3D arch, a 3D structure in compression. All right, but as I already said, I also have some bad news. And the bad news is that structural geometry is complex geometry. So if we don't find appropriate, local, locally relevant strategies to build these structures, we will not get there. Uh, thank you, Diedrich. This is from your PhD. A very convincing structural model. A Pringle carrying 500 times its self-weight. Okay, Diedrich did 250, but another student sent me 500 times its self-weight. So again, demonstrating that strength through geometry is beautiful. This is, by the way, a, a, a bad loading case. But we don't see too many beautiful surface structures in concrete because, as you can imagine, and also from the details of Manfred's presentation, they are only used for unique projects because they need a unique budget. And the unique budget goes to 
a gigantic foundation, all this scaffolding, and then months, if not years, of fabrication of the specific formwork, the shuttering, that will turn into this after 28 days or whatever the concrete needs to harden. So that is where Diedrich started in our research group to explore the idea of uh, fabric formwork, and more specifically here we have a hybrid. We have a cable net as a false work supporting the concrete, and the fabric is there to apply um, the, the, uh, to, to cast or pour the concrete. Another way to look at that is can we, from the traditional formwork, the inefficiencies is because we need to build a rigid formwork. And so you need this foundation, all this scaffolding, and all this forming that typically is really absolutely not reused. So can we go to a flexible system? What's important there, though, is that, of course, you don't get anything for free is that you need to then design and include the constraints of a flexible forming system into your uh, design pipeline. So can we go from this to a shell like this? This was a prototype we did uh, two years ago, a full-scale prototype for a project that I will show you that is now on site. What is maybe not clear is that the bounding box of this shell is 20 meters by 10 meters by seven and a half meters. And this is a structural concrete shell of three centimeters to 12 centimeters locally at the support, just to give you a bit of context. At a certain point, because this is for our project, our clients were like, yeah, okay, you're, you seem pretty smart, but we don't believe that you can do it. And that's why we had to do this one-to-one -one full scale prototype to de demonstrate a system. So we did this with the partners that would actually do the construction. And so here you see the Marty uh, crew, co coincidentally the same that were in my very first image that did the prime tower. And we gave them this system and we developed a kit of parts that could, with just three people, in one week's time, be assembled on site. So again, this seems maybe not special, but imagine the opposite. You would literally be milling for months and months and months. You would need to plan all the logistics. This is a kit of parts that nicely comes together in just one week by three people. And here you see also maybe this money shot clarifies why we're doing this, because we are not only we, have, uh, we can already start the interior finishes, <laughs> jokingly said, but also we are very lightweight to carry all the wet concrete. The system is, by the way, 100% reusable, and that is what we are now using on-site. We can just reconfigure for on-site. So here, this is the fabric. Okay, again, uh, I already said rigid, you need to design for, so you don't get anything for free. So in order to basically be efficient and be actually real, is we needed to develop these algorithms. So what are we doing? We're pre-stressing the cable net so that it's non-uniform, so that it's a little bit higher than where it needs to be. And under the weight of the wet concrete, it hits exactly the geometry, right? So this sounds pretty smart, right? Um, I'm also very pleased that Tom and I won in 2011 the Tsuboy Award for this new idea and algorithm. Unfortunately, wait, one more comment, we can now also entirely constrain, for example, the facade lines so that we know exactly where the cables are. Unfortunately, this has absolutely nothing to do with reality. Because in reality, even in Switzerland, you can be 100% certain that the boundary conditions will not be exactly there where you need it to be. And if it's off by a centimeter, a millimeter, it doesn't matter. Your three-dimensional cable net, your formwork, will not be where it needs to be. And I want to emphasize, and this relates also to the comment that I made with masonry assessment. You can claim or show the client that you 100% simulated properly with very sophisticated models how this cable net will work. It is irrelevant. So also you see these connections, they can behave slightly different and so on. So we had to implement a monitoring scheme that we know exactly where the cable net is. But then we're not done yet. Because in this specific case, we have 120 turnbuckles around the boundaries. That gives you about 90 trillion combinations of tightening, loosening, and so on, which is the one that actually redirects our cable net exactly where it needs to be. Luckily, there are smart mathematicians in automation control that have that exactly. It has to do with the reducing the null space, and so on, and so on. And so from all these 90 trillion options, they, we developed with them actually exactly which one is the one that redirects. And we tested this indeed. And with already just one cycle, 
we went from an, a maximum deviation of nine centimeters to just one centimeter of deviation from this funky geometry. I like this image because this was a milestone in this project. I present this like this was all a success. Believe me, these were painful seven years of our lives. One of the reasons was that no contractor, even at full cost, wanted to embarrass themselves with us, with these young, young researchers that thought they would revolutionize construction. So we had to look, 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 and after one and a half years, we finally found these contractors. But believe me, they were skeptical, and they were very verbal about it, until this moment. Because at this moment, they noticed that the node that we designed, which is here, that we needed for the measuring, actually solve the entire logistics. That this crazy funky geometry was reduced to a simple patch of 40 by 40. That was very simple because nothing could go wrong. All the logistics, all the measuring, like how thick locally does the concrete need to be, where does the reinforcement need to be attached, and so on and so on was covered with this. This is a textile reinforced or carbon beton, or I don't know exactly what the right term is. Uh, of course, because we don't have the cover this is also in the final context, the shell is only three centimeters. Obviously, having studied with Marijke and so on, we know perfectly how to make cutting patterns, so we could use the same cutting patterns as the fabric, and then a little bit of concrete magic, to be honest, to be able to apply this on top. So there it was, prototype, ready. I like this. This is an actual quote. I will not say by who, but let's say that it's by an extremely big office that deals with very complicated uh, structures, BIM on steroids. And that is because we enhanced building information modeling with our open source computational framework. And I don't have time to make a pitch. This will be the future. Hmm. Um, but what we could do with Compass is actually without data loss interface with companies that have absolutely no digitalization in their process. In Switzerland, when certain countries in the world are already talking about BIM 2.0 or 3.0 even, in Switzerland we are dealing with BIM minus 2.0, right? So this is, this is what this process allowed us, but also to integrate totally new ideas in a commercial project. So the gray balls are actually researchers with totally new algorithms in a project that will really be on site. And if you want to know more about Compass, it is open source, so it's well documented, so you can go ahead. Now we finally are on site, super exciting. A little bit complicated is that we're building this on top of a building. Also, the structural scheme evolved. It's a two-layer shell for all kinds of reasons, particularly because it's a real facade and it's a architectural concrete from the inside to the outside. So we have an insulation layer, we have all kinds of things. But what's maybe interesting is that you see that the same node actually does, continues to do all the logistics. The second layer is controlled. The, even the fabric, the fabric, uh, sorry, the, the membrane uh, waterproofing is connected to the same element. So everything is under control by us. Maybe interesting to you is that this two-layer um, uh, uh, concrete shell, so two layers of twice three centimeters, with a spacing of almost 20 centimeters, actually has a full ductile behavior, which was extremely important for our local engineer. And of course, because this is a real project and not just a prototype, we, dis we developed all these, all these details to, for example, the, third, uh, the second one on the, on the right is the details with the facade. So that, unlike Isler, that needed to have, uh, uh, for example, insulation on the inside, we have concrete showing from the inside all the way to the outside. And actually, the most important detail is the second one on the left, because this is a both aesthetic and structural detail to make cold joints, so that this surface, this crazy surface, doesn't need to be cast in one go, but we can do this as a, at a pace that makes sense. So all these details were, um, were, were, were uh, uh, prototyped. We demonstrate that we are up to five millimeters of tolerances, which is expected. And I look forward to this beautiful aesthetic of a fabric imprinted in this uh, structure. This is from uh, uh, last, last week. So we are now on site. Do notice, and this is really not because it's Switzerland, but because the site is super clean and simple. 
and also the minimal amount of struts that we need to basically assemble this super lightweight formwork that will carry the 20 tons of wet concrete. I'll move on. So here you see it being assembled, and it is really within five millimeters. The project lead couldn't believe it, and I said, but what do you mean? Have you not listened to us the last seven years? But apparently this is remarkable in a real construction site. So there we are, it's ready to be cast. Casting starts in three weeks. Maybe one thing that you notice is that there is many steps and operations on site, and that is where things really can get out of control. If a pump breaks, then the crew is on site. In Switzerland, that means you go bankrupt immediately, because cost of labor is very, very expensive. So we thought, can we do better? Can we go on site with something that is even lighter and where everything is embedded? And that is, so literally, can we do this? Can we go on site with our little backpack? This is Mariana, Mariana Popescu, that is her research. And we demonstrated this then in Knit Candela, where we actually used a knitted formwork to realize this shell with, uh, in collaboration with Zahadit Architects. Let's quickly look at the process. So the in initial topology was provided by Zahadit Architects and then we had to make it work. So this is then the structural form finding. Uh, in this case, we didn't take a risk. So it's still a cable nut, but instead of a cut fabric, it's an entirely 3D knitted fabric. And that allowed us also, uh, so this, what you see here, by the way, is the fully automated pipeline that Mayana developed for her PhD to go from any geometry to direct knitting operations that you feed into any knitting machine. So here you see that we have this highly optimized external frame. I will come back to this later. This was done with Compass so that Andrew Liu, who is now in Sheffield, could do hundreds of iterations and even make decisions on site when things went not exactly. By the way, this is arguably the largest scarf ever knitted in the world. That was then packaged by Mayana and her colleagues Lex, our concrete magician, to literally be carried on site in two suitcases. Two suitcases, because they're students, if they would have flown business, they would have needed only one suitcase because the total weight of the formwork is 25 kilograms. So there, the local assembly, this was decided by the contractor locally. We provided all the geometry and the, did all the fabrication data. This was Matthias who did all of this. But here you see one of the key arguments. The entire logistics is embedded in this 3D knit with pockets, with features. Nothing can go wrong. Everything is in that geometry. So you can do this with local labor, in this case with the cheapest labor possible, which obviously are students. And uh, so this was then assembled by Mariana with some local students she never met before arriving there on site. So here we have the tightening and you see the knit uh, uh, from the inside. We also in, uh, developed some very simple kind of additional features because ending a shell is very complicated. And so we folded over this fabric to have a clean detailing. And then here you see these modeling balloons. I will talk about this later that provided these pockets. This is a fast setting cement base that allows this knit to be just stiff enough that it can serve as a regular formwork like any other formwork. So here you see this. And so here you see also that it looks like Swiss chocolate. So it might, might be good. And then the local expert Mexican crafts, there is a lot of crafts in, in uh, expertise in Mexico, they could just finish it. It's just a canvas like any other. It got very dark suddenly. And this one, then the result, so a six by six meter, four and a half meters high, five ton concrete shell built on a knit of 25 kilograms and the cable net was 30 kilograms. All right, so here you see this literally came on site in not a backpack, but a, a suitcase. And then this insertion of the, uh, uh, in this pocket. So what we did is we developed a two layer knit that had an aesthetic continuous inside. We also wanted to show new opportunities for shells. And the outside has all the logistics and the technical layers. So here, for example, the knit is designed such that if you put inflatables, it inflates just until where we designed it. And as I said, we needed to stiffen this because otherwise it would be too flexible to really work on. But this is the point. So in, uh, we had limitations on the ground, so we could not 
in a, fib uh, a fiber reinforced concrete shell, we could not go thicker. So we needed to limit to three centimeters of shell. And then we had stiffeners in both directions that gave us increased structural depth without the crazy accumulation of weight. So this is a very complicated formwork, and I will come back to this later. And this was all done with a simple knit. And an important point here is that all of us in computation should really challenge what we are doing. In this case, I took on this project because I know my Mexican colleagues can finish this shell really fast and quickly. So they have these local manual crafts locally. We just gave them literally a more interesting canvas than making a kitchen tabletop. And so this kind of strategic implementation of digitalization is also important to be um, looked at. So this was the re result. Appropriately, Mayana was wearing a knitted dress for the opening. And here from the top. Academics, and I have been like that in the past, are not always very transparent on the real costs, the real numbers of things. So let's maybe look at the shells. So we are talking about 50 square meters of concrete that in total weighs about five tons. The knit was 25 kilograms. All the connectors, all the cable net, 30 kilograms. So with 55 kilograms, we carry five tons of concrete. And then the big question, the entire material cost of the formwork, so the knit, the cable net, and the fast setting stiffening paste is 2,250 euros. So that is what it costs to make this highly sophisticated formwork that took only 36 hours to knit. If you would do this with state-of-the-art milling, this would take three months. And the first email when we were invited to do the, until the opening was three and a half months. So only fabrication, so not design, development, prototyping, engineering would not have been possible at all. This project now got bigger. We have five PhD students working on this to also, for example, address this. It's not just about shaping, but also about including the reinforcement. And I hope to be back in three years and show you that we can do this. What I find not unimportant as well is this image. This technology is abundantly available all over the world because that is how our clothing is being made. And what is better than sending 25 kilograms of phone work is just sending data and doing all the logistics locally. And so that is a big outlook that we have with this project. All right, but with the last minutes that I have, I want to conclude in a project that I believe will have most impact of what we do. It's the most boring project, but it's one that really brings all of these things together. We reduce the structural volume uh, through uh, structural geometry. We activate funicular form to use very low polluting, so low embodied carbon materials, and we use digital fabrication to make it eco economically viable. I'm talking about, and we heard already about this, a solution for a shell, for a floor. Because you probably are thinking like, yeah, cute pavilions, he gets to work with all these rich people. What is the impact? What's the relevance of his research? And actually, this is where it might be. So let's go back to this three quarters of the weight in multi-story buildings. What I didn't tell you is that actually 55% of this weight is in the floor slabs. So more than 40% of the total weight of a significantly uh, high enough building is actually in the floor slabs. We already covered this part, that from going from the inefficient bending to reactivating the tight arch system, we for free save already more than 70% of material. So we thought, let's really demonstrate this, and we developed for the same project in Hilo, this floor plate. Two centimeters of unreinforced concrete that is designed as a stiffened shell, so the shell takes the dead loads, the stiffeners take the live loads in compression to the corners, and then we have externalized tension ties, which is important. I will talk about this later as well. So we did already some prototypes extremely early. And as I said, either you develop this as a modular system with very expensive two-sided molds that are not necessarily the nicest, or you find a way to really develop fully bespoke uh, solutions like large-scale 3D printing. This is sand printing, not the sand we are running out of, but the sand we have abundantly available in deserts. So this is 3D sand printing, and this makes these fully uh, large-scale elements that actually are never meant to be structural. But that is exactly what I like people to tell me. This material is equally strong 
as the material we used in Ethiopia. About two megapascals in compression, and you can snap it as easily as cold dark chocolate. In this case, of course, the superior Belgian chocolate. But this is not just about geometry. This, we have some other important lessons to learn from the past. If I would just build this in this geometry, then the structure will tell me where it's unhappy. It will crack like the dome of the Pantheon in Rome. It has ra gigantic radial cr cracks that you don't see because they're plastered over, but it's the dome telling, I am an arch, I'm a fault, a, a dome on top, and I'm arches towards the support because you have tension hoops. So we want to prevent this by actually pre-discretizing our structure in the same way as Maillard for this very new material at the time, pre-discretized its, its arch in a three-hinged arch, so that with graphic statics, no surprise, he could for any loading case demonstrate that he found a compression line that remained within the section. So that is what you need to do when you have a weak material that has absolutely no bending capacity. And indeed, his new fabrication strategies allows us to do that. We did the full ACI required loading combinations to demonstrate that it is up to code. And if you don't believe me here, this is almost a ton of ETH nerds standing on a two centimeter floor plate with material properties equivalent to chocolate. Again, here you might say like, yeah, okay, but this guy, real engineering, uh, redundancy, resilience, all of this, he's not talking about this. Okay, we covered that as well because we are now commercializing this floor, so believe me, we need to demonstrate all of that. I don't have time to talk about it, but if you still think that I'm a little bit naive, Let's go back to this structure. What I didn't tell you is that this unreinforced tile vault that has similar proportions to our floor plate is actually carrying the Vanderbilt Hall on top. The Vanderbilt Hall is one of the two main entrances of Grand Central Terminal. So if you think that we are crazy, sometimes I get engineers comment this after my lecture, like I will never enter a building you designed, then three to four million New Yorkers are risking their lives going to work every single day. Can you imagine the impact of saving more than 70% of materials on this dominant structural element that takes up more than 40% of the mass? It percolates down. Seismic response will be totally different. There is a lot of opportunity. And together with colleagues in building systems, we are activating this volume where structure used to be to have highly efficient building systems. And rather than, this is in a way kind of BIM clash detection. So it's just ignoring clashes, but just stacking them. In a Singapore context, that means that a an average floor depth in between the floors is one and a half to two meters just because of all this layering. So we can offer the clients not only lighter, cheaper, almost no embodied energy, uh, uh, carbon, but we can give them also 20, at least 25% more real estate for the same building height. So this seems like win, 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 win. And that is why we are really now pushing this together with industry partners to make this happen. And we need solutions like this. Because another way to translate what Bill and Melinda Gates said is we need to in the next 30 year, years, double the amount of floor area in this world, in this same planet. So we need a lot of floors, and so let's please not build this as if inefficiently as we have been doing the last 100 years. So I hope that this will be a gigantic success indeed, but not unimportant, and that is why we fully believe in an open source project, is let's share, let's work together, because the challenges are too big, the urgency is too important, we need to start collaborating because we, all of us, are killing our planet at a rapid pace. So where is this now going forward? Is that someone needs to take the risk. Someone needs to demonstrate that this is real, that this happens. And as I said, in the same project, we will have the two first unreinforced floor systems implemented fully up to code, fully engineered. I admit in Switzerland we are, have a little bit more flexibility than Germany, for example, but this floor is entirely going there. And I wanted to quickly come back to this image that we saw, I think, in, Bill, in Bill's lecture, that indeed most of these people, most of this growing will not happen where we are. One thing is we have an important, um, um, an important uh, a role in showing that we also want to live like that. So that is first. And secondly, 
is that I'm extremely pleased, and I will only tease because I, send, I signed too many NDAs, so I cannot show you more, but we are addressing this problem with the uh, 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 government of South Africa. What is this problem? I didn't say that the framework here is eucalyptus, which is a non-indigenous -indig uh, plant in Africa, and that means that it sucks so much water out of the ground, and this is a common problem in Africa, that basically entire river beds and lakes are, em are dry and empty. So what the South African government has decided a couple of years ago is to cut all these toxic plants. And they developed basically, what are they doing? They shre shred these plants and they developed a mix to make uh, a new type of concrete that has 70% polluting biomass. And so with that, we are working with local authorities to, in this case, not to do everything prefab, but to actually put all the cleverness in the geometry so that we can activate as many people on site. By the way, something that I forgot to say is because we separate compression and tension, our systems are 100% recyclable. We don't pollute them with different kind of components. So that is also an important in, uh, outlook in the context of uh, Jan Jan's uh, plenary lecture indeed. So I want to finish here because I like this project. It's aesthetic. It was Matthias' aesthetic. But what it tells us is that we reduce the volume by more than 70% because we have a structural geometry. We activate super weak material. I don't care it's specifically this 3D printed material. We actually demonstrated that it works. We stood all on it. We did all the loading cases that we were required by code. And this really shows an opportunity of really adopting, like Bill also said, new opportunities because of new technologies, new research, new kind of ideas. So, but the lessons learned are structural geometry gives us less material, funicular form can give us better material, less polluting material, and through computational fabrication, we can actually realize these structures now without crazy amount of waste. This was my team in March. I have amazing researchers, and I can only show their work. But uh, thank you for your uh, attention.